when we began to take the Bible, the Ten Commandments, God out of our public places, we began to go downhill. Amen. And so pray for our nation. Pray for our young people. Pray a protective hand on those that are in school, no matter what kind of school. Just pray that God would watch over them and that God would give a revival to this country uh, that we get some young people step up and want to be a great testimony for the Lord. Look in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to read one verse, but of course you know you need to stay here as we look into the Word of God tonight. But I want to look, if we could tonight, at verse number 6. In so much that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. And I want to preach tonight on a thought, but use several verses tonight, on the subject of finish what you started. Finish what you started. And I'll share a little bit about that in the context of Scripture. I was reading after one man that made a comment. I agree with this. He says, when we get outside of the Word of God to get in our pulpits, then what we do is we get on dangerous ground. And we need to be sure to stay in the Word of God so that the Word of God can change lives. Friend, it's not the preacher's fancy outline or a title or a joke or any of that that makes a difference. It is the Word of God. And so tonight, I want to give you the Word of God. They say that it takes three books to make a church do what it needs to do. It takes God's book, the Bible. It takes a song book, and it takes a pocket book. Amen. And I promise you what you're sitting in tonight that is paid for, matter of fact, all this property is because somebody was willing to experience what chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians is all about in their life. And so we're going to pray and then we're going to ride out the storm. Father, thank you so much tonight for the Word of God. Lord, I pray tonight, may you bless and touch tonight's service. Give us what we need. Lord, help us, God, to realize that, Lord, we can be a big part of what you do uh, in church. Lord, I thank you for what you do. We ask it in Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated tonight. The last time I preached in this book, Chapter 8, and I said it's one of the great chapters in the Bible. Uh, Brother Russell's up at a church he dropped in tonight close to home that has a new pastor. And then Brother Tater's here this morning. The Paquette family are here tonight. They would all tell you if you've been in mission conferences long or if you've been around men like Dr. Caldwell and others that talk about missions in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians is one of the chapters in the Bible that lets us know what it's like to give by faith, grace giving, may I say tonight. And I want to say tonight as we look at chapter number 8, the example that we started with was the church at Macedonia. And of course you know tonight that this church was a church that had very little, but yet out of their very little, they gave much and God blessed that. And God did some great things. And the reason Paul was admonishing the church at Corinth about this was because Paul wanted the church at Corinth to help take care of those saints who were poor, uh, those in Jerusalem even that had started in the churches and didn't have anything because family and others had forsaken them. Many had lost their job because they had given their life to Christ. And so Paul is teaching the church how to give and what to do in order to help other churches. He also uh, is wanting to get all this done before he ever gets back to Corinth because he didn't want to come or he didn't want to have to ask for anything when he was with them. But now what I want us to do is realize this. What happens here in the Word of God is that 
The church at Corinth began to do what Titus had suggested for them to do. They began to give. But now you'll read down through here and about a year has passed and I'll share this with you in the Word of God and Paul says make sure that you finish what you started. And by the way, that applies to everything in our life. I believe in a, as a Christian we are to finish what we start and we are to be finished and, and until we finish it we are to keep on doing what God wants us to do. Someone asked me how long will I be in the ministry? I'll be in the ministry until I'm finished. Amen. You serve God until you're gone, you're finished, and we need to do that. So I want you to begin with me to look in the Word of God, if you would. We'll go back to verse 4. Praying us with much injury that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministers and the saints. You remember the word fellowship meant partnership. In other words, Paul said we want to be partners with those uh, uh, that are helping in getting the gospel around the world. And this they did, not as we'd hoped, of course, but gave them own selves to the Lord and us by the will of God. What Paul says is they did more than we even thought they'd do. In verse 6, And so much that we desired Titus, that as he begun, so would he also finish in you the same grace also. Now, he's going to give us some thoughts what about grace given in your life. I want you to notice how God had worked in the church at Corinth and how He can work in us tonight. The Bible says, therefore, as you abound in everything. In other words, Paul said, I'm going to give you some things that you're abounding in, that you're doing great in, that I'm proud of the way you're doing them. But just like you're abounding in those things, I want you to abound in your giving to other churches as well. Of course, we know in our day we would call giving to other churches like that around the world missions. And Paul said, I want you to do that. I've said to people over and over again, if you're new to Calvary, if you haven't been here a long period of time, I believe the reason God has so honored and blessed this ministry is because of missions. I believe God honors those that honor His Word and send His Word around the world and so that God can bless those that, that, that give in faith promise missions. The Bible goes on to say here, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, then he gives those in faith. Paul is saying here, your faith has got stronger. How many believe tonight without faith it is impossible to please God? He says your faith has got stronger. Then he says an utterance. The word utterance you find in the Greek word logos which simply means word. In other words, the Corinthian church had got in the word. They had began to live the word of God. And let me say this tonight. If you're going to put your faith in anything, put your faith in the word of God. The word of God will not let you down. The word of man may let you down, but the Word of God will not let you down. The Bible says, and knowledge. What does he mean by knowledge? He simply means this. He means the Word of God that you know. You have knowledge of doctrine. You have knowledge of truth. You have stuck by the things you have learned. And let me say this tonight. We can't build churches uh, on what the preacher said. We can't build churches on emotion. We can't build churches uh, on books off the shelf somebody else wrote. But friend, if a church is to be solid and it is to be doctrinal, what it ought to be? Churches ought to simply be built by the Word of God. And we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. I'm afraid in our day, church has become so entertainment driven that a lot of the people, as long as it's entertainment driven and they're happy and they're joyous, they stick in. But boy, as soon as the guitar is put down, the drumsticks are laid down, the praise team walks off the platform, they don't know how to live. The reason they don't know how to live is because they're not in the Word. And friend, I'm going to tell you what, it's not a song that will make you live. It is the Word of God that will make you live right. It is this Bible. And the Corinthian church knew in their heart, they knew in their heart that they had to have knowledge of what the Word of God said. And I want to encourage you, go to Sunday school. I want to encourage you, read your Bible. Have knowledge of what God said. The doctrines of this church are Bible doctrines. The Bible goes on to say here in the Word of God, uh, not only knowledge and all diligence. Diligence. I looked that word up, diligence. Very interesting. Here's what God is saying. He's saying you got zeal. 
He said you got great zeal over what? Over knowledge. Over what? Over utterance. Shine the logos, the word of God. You have great zeal. And Paul says you need to keep that zeal as you serve the Lord. But then he says this. And in your love to us. See that you abound in this grace. All. What, is, what is this grace also? It's grace given. It's grace given. Paul said that everything that drives you ought to be your love for God. Everything that drives you ought to be your love for Christ. You ought to have a strong desire and a love for the things of God. A love for Christ. And Paul says that when it comes to your giving, it ought to be the same. Remember, he's not talking about giving to the local church here. Even though he's talking about giving to the church. But he's talking about helping Christians that are struggling may I say missions he's talking about reaching those that do not have and let me say this tonight we are to have a zeal for missions a zeal to reach the world a zeal to see people say friend the church is not a place for us to come and have a little pep rally and then go back to our jobs and go back home and never have a burden the church ought to be a place where we come and we get a burden for the souls of men and women and we have a desire to want to get out and reach them with the gospel we ought to have a zeal for the bus ministry, a zeal for missions we ought to have a zeal for knocking on doors we ought have a zeal for soul winning. We ought to have a zeal in our life for the things of God. Churches are not driven to be entertainment places. They ought to be driven to be places, soul winning stations where we send out people with the gospel. That's good preaching right there. I realize that that a lot of people will say, oh, I, listen, we need to get it. I speak not by commandment. What Paul says, I'm not commanding you this. I speak not by commandment but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Isn't it amazing? You know what Paul's saying? Paul said if you really love, you'll give. Paul said if you really love, you'll be faithful. Paul said if you really love, you'll do the things that you ought to do. And so Paul says it ought to be driven by your love. He goes on to say, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his mighty or his poverty might be rich. How did Jesus become poor? He became poor when he became man. He came to this world and he put off the robes of glory, the riches of glory. And he took upon himself the servant and he became poor. Why? Because he wanted to show us that it's not the abundance of things, but he gave himself. And the Bible lets us know the greatest example of giving is the way Jesus gave. The way Jesus gave. Verse 10, And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before, now watch, here's my year, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. You know what he said? He said, You told the Lord God put in your heart, you were going to do this. And here's what Paul said, finish it. Finish it. Can I say this tonight? There are a lot of things in my life that are not spiritual things, but there are things in my life that I have just decided I don't want to be a quitter. Quitting is just not, anybody can quit. Quitting is not hard. Matter of fact, we live in a generation today. If your marriage isn't good, quit. If you don't like this, quit. If somebody at church doesn't pat you on the back and stick a pacifier in your mouth, quit. I mean, it just seems so easy for people to quit in our day. And we raise a generation of quitters. I try once a week, get up in the morning, and I drive up to Lenny's Mill and I get on Brushy Mountain Road and climb Brushy Mountain Road up about 2,000 feet up on my bicycle. Most time by myself, early. Enjoy just that. Besides that, one dog that will never leave me alone. And he finds me at the steepest place where you can't get away. So you just have to either he's going to bite me or whatever. But there is a section on that road 
that I'll be honest with you, it is hard. I, and when you write it enough, you know it's coming. And you know when you get there, you don't have any gear left. You're the littlest one you got. You are sweating. Your heart rate is about 180. You, 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 and for my age, 180 can blow your heart out of your chest. And, and you're thinking, and I have three different times almost quit or stopped right there and took a break. And I can hear myself going, oh, man, I'm glad nobody's around me. I hear myself saying, don't you quit. Don't you quit. Nobody's with me. If I were to stop, I wouldn't have to tell anybody. Nobody might would know, but I'd know. Now, that has nothing to do spiritually, but I want you to think. In our life, there are going to be times when it's not going to be easy. There are going to be times when it's going to be a little tougher than other times. There are going to be times when you're going to want to quit. You remember that promise you made to the Lord with Faith Promise Missions? Uh, you remember how you said, well, I'm going to get in church. Listen, I've had people come to me and say, Preacher, I'm going to get in church. I'm going to get in church. And about two or three weeks, they did fine. Then they quit. And by the way, you, you're not going to stay in church by your emotions. You're not going to stay in church with the music at Calvary, though it's good, you're going to stay in church by being in love with Jesus. Amen? So Paul says to Corinthian believers, don't quit. He says, now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so may there be a performance also out of that which ye have. Stay with me here. Watch this. For if there be first a willing mind is accepted according to that man hath and not according that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and you burden. Hey, this is interesting. Paul said, I don't believe, I don't believe that you ought to have to carry all the load. Everybody ought to do their part. Now this will get very quiet. But if everybody did their part in this church, we wouldn't have any problem building that building I'm talking about. I'll just leave it there because you know whether or not you're doing your part. But if we did our part, did you know the average Baptist church in America, 10% of the people carry 100% of the load? That's sad. That's sad. He goes on to say, but by our quality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply of for their want, and that your abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there be equality. He's going back to relate this. If you remember the manna that fell from heaven, some went out and got a bunch, some got a little bit, and the ones that had more than they needed, they would give to others who didn't have enough, so that everybody had manna. And God says, that's the way it ought to be when we're serving God. If God's blessed you, then by all means, you ought to be a blessing if God's blessed you. Amen. Amen. It takes three things to make a church do what it needs to do. It takes God's book, hymn book, pocket book. But we can hear that rain good, can't we? Let me tell you why we can hear it good. Because in order to give to God's work, you have to give yourself first. Amen. And I want to say this, and I believe this. I believe with all my heart that if we will give ourselves to God, uh, it's said, and I believe this, you can tell by how much someone loves the Lord by how they give to the Lord's work. And I believe that's true. There are some men that are not even strong about a tithe because they believe it's too little. Some believe we should do more. I've always in my ministry believed doing more is good. I've always done that. God's blessed that. But I want to say this to you. Don't you understand this? Giving is a big part of the Christian life. It's a huge part. We have children in our church that, that give. They give. We get, we get envelopes sometimes. Tie envelopes in the office. Where it's a quarter, a dollar. Where children are taught to give. Why is that so important? Now, if you know me, I never preach on money. 
I don't know when. I can't even remember preaching on money, tithing, any. I can't even remember it. But I am preaching through the book. And we have come to chapter 8. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? I don't like to do that stuff. I, you know, because any time a preacher mentions money, that's all he's in it for. You know. So I just said, I don't even do it. I just, you know, if you want to rob God, you stand one day at the beam of seat and tell him why you did it. And you will tell him why you did it. And you will answer for it. You ain't going to take something as mine and me know you're taking it and not deal with it. But, in all happiness, God's work is funded by giving. Our passage in context is about giving to churches like missions that need it. Listen, I am convinced there's yet to be seen what God's going to do here on this property. If we continue to give to missions and get the gospel around the world. This ministry literally last year gave nearly $200,000. Not to here, not to the preacher, not to the associate pastors, not to the staff, but to missions around the world. Nearly $200,000. That's above a tithe. And you know what? I know what you're thinking. Boy, there must be some rich person. No. We have some that give very good. Matter of fact, I think the more you have, the more you ought to give. I think we ought to give out of our abundance. I believe that. God's blessed you. Give some of it. Amen. But I'll say this to you. I'll say this to you. A lot of that missions come in simply because people were obedient to do what God said in His Word to do. That's been going on here. I've been here 15 years. Dr. Caldwell, seven years. So you add the 15 to seven. We got 22 years right there. And then, I don't know how mission wise boys before that with Brother Goodman and others here. But I'm going to tell you, that's 22 years of giving sacrificially so the gospel could get around the world. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. It is amazing to me what grace giving can do in your life. It is. Can I say this tonight? I don't give to get. I don't give to get. I don't, I don't give to mission so I can get something. But I usually get something. God just honors it. God honors it, doesn't he? Some of you give to missions. You know what I'm talking about. I could go through this church. Some people, I've been their pastor whole 15 years I've been here, and they'll tell you, boy, if you're just faithful to God, God will honor it. He'll do it. I'm glad my wife's mom taught her early in her life to give. I'm glad that when I got saved, I'm glad I got around Dr. Caller. Boy, I'm glad because I didn't understand all the blessing of faith promise. But I'm glad God taught it to me. You know why? Because some Bible's going to get to some missionary on the field. Some church is going to be constructed in Columbia because somebody gives. Amen. What's the first thing you got to give though? You got to give yourself. You got to give yourself. Amen. Can I say this tonight? Brother Mike, can you bring me an offering plate? Just bring me one up here just a moment. Trevor, come here a minute. Let me show you how to give. Take your shoes off. Thank you. Put one foot in that plate. Put the other foot in that plate. That's how you give. You got that on screen, Daddy? That's how you give. You give yourself. And if, can you stay right there? Are you okay? And if you give yourself, then God can take what you give. And God can bless others. Amen. You're talking to a preacher who's done it for 34 years. I'm going to tell you. And you know what? Listen. I don't go around poor mouthing or sad storying. God's been good to me. And I'll tell you why he's been good to me. I learned a long time ago. Listen. You do right, God will take care of you. 
Amen. Do I want to go to Hendrick BMW and buy a 9 Series BMW for about $70,000 and drive it over here? You better believe I do. Will I? No. But I'll tell you this, if it was God's will, He might send you buy it and bring it to me. <laughs> See where Trevor is? He's, he, he gave himself. And that's what we got to do. Thank you, sir.